Well, hello and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. My name is David Baer, and today we're going to be talking about legal marketing, not the laws around marketing, but marketing within the legal profession. How do attorneys get connected with their clients is basically what we're going to talk about. And I, I want to start off this conversation by observing something that, you know, back when I first got started in the world of marketing, and this this was my days back in like the theater marketing. So um, perhaps I don't know a lot about uh, the world of marketing for uh, attorneys and legal professionals, but the only marketing that I saw out there was for I was I was going to use the the um, probably pejorative uh, term of ambulance chasers, but we'll, we'll we'll politely say personal injury attorneys. Right? They were the ones who would advertise in the yellow pages. If you don't know what that is, please look it up. Uh, and you would see billboards, sides of buses, things like that. But I wouldn't see other attorneys with ads out there. Right? Maybe you might see like a a big prestigious firm taking a big, you know, full page ad out in, uh, I, I think like the, the symphony, uh, um, program is, is where I always see it. Like, you know, on the, on the back cover that the, the symphony is sponsored by, or they're, they're big supporters of an arts institution or something like that, but marketing and advertising and lead generation for attorneys and legal professionals really has not been done in the same way as many, many other industries. That is until recently. And because I don't know a heck of a lot about this topic, I've invited a guest who does. In fact, she not only specializes in legal marketing, she was at one point an attorney herself and maybe still is a member of a bar. I don't know. We'll find out in just a moment when we welcome Jessica Aries. Hey, Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I will fess up. I don't carry the bar card anymore. There's some heavy dues around that and liability things that I don't want to cover. So just solely focused on legal marketing now. But yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, indeed. And quite frankly, I, I said ambulance chasers because that was the only phrase I could remember. I couldn't remember what they actually are called. So <laughs> personal injury attorneys is what I meant to say, but I, that other one just slipped out. So is that a reasonable assessment, sort of that story, that that picture that I painted of what it used to be like? And, and, and then I, I want to understand, like, how did we move away from that and toward what we're dealing with these days? Yeah, so that that is a pretty reasonable assessment of kind of the landscape of legal marketing in the beginning. And a lot of that has to do with the profession of legal in general. So lawyers in, them, in and of themselves believe that their entire profession doesn't necessarily necessitate marketing because it is one of those professions in their mind that doesn't have to require any kind of like email marketing campaigns or any kind of outreach of that, that referral business and the idea of actually um, generating business through referral sources is the way they should be developing relationships and networking. And that really shifted, um, I guess, maybe the last 20-ish years or so ago um, when there became a lot more competition in legal. Um, the big law firms got bigger <laughs> and they started to realize, wow, there's a strategy behind this. Wow, there's business people who could help us <laughs> with this. Yeah. Maybe we should hire some of those people <laughs> and, and learn about, especially with the rise of like the accounting firms, like the big four, like Deloitte, PwC. Some of those big firms started to realize, wow, there's an opportunity to think differently about the way we engage clients. And there's an opportunity for us to not just rely on referral sources, but actually create a marketing strategy and be a little bit more intentional in the way we approach client development, business development, and marketing in general. Yeah. So that that was the big shift. Um, competition. <laughs> competition mm -hmm. will always make things uh, a little bit more competitive, or not a little bit more competitive, uh, uh, seek an opportunity for marketing, create a blue ocean opportunity for marketing in that sense. Yeah. Um, so that's really what happened. So, and, you know, you say around 20 years ago, and I think that that probably coincides with a lot of technology being at the center of the way that we buy and sell things. And so there was the, the competition was naturally, you know, going to happen because there was a lot more um, direct access by businesses to get in front of people. 
in in these digital spaces whereas you know previously we were existing in a non-digital world and so i i guess they needed to kind of you know either be be a part of it or not exist anymore potentially well, and the way we've communicated shifted. Um, if you think of the rise of social networks, you think of the rise of the internet in general, um, it gave us a different way to interact, a different way to communicate. And then COVID was like the second wave of a new way of thinking about marketing and thinking about the way we interact with each other. And um, back in the day, there was very much this prestige. I say back in the day, 20 plus years ago, there was a lot of um, this viewpoint that the profession as a whole shouldn't market too much. And in fact, the Legal Marketing Association, which I'm a part of, didn't even come into fruition until like the mid 80s, I want to say 1980s. Mm. And in that time, I mean, there were only a handful of people that called themselves marketers. And even then, they were mainly just like making brochures and pamphlets, like they weren't doing a lot of the strategic thinking around marketing, because they didn't have that that buy-in yet within law firms. And so um, they didn't have kind of those types of roles. And so in the 90s, with the rise of technology, the rise of the internet, the rise of people communicating differently, it all became much more strategic and a lot more measurable as we mm -hmm. all saw. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I'm, I am familiar not with the legal world as much as other um, professional services, um, businesses like financial planning, right? And mm -hmm. I know plenty of financial planners who are, you know, the second generation in a family business and the parent built up the business by going out and networking and getting referrals. And really, it was all about relationship, which is sort of how legal, you know, um, uh, business building has happened in the past. But then the kid comes into the business and that doesn't work anymore. And so they've had to take on a much more direct, uh, direct marketing approach and and um, uh, authoritative positioning and and showing off their range of knowledge and maybe even figuring out ways to demonstrate that they specialize in a particular narrower area. All things that you're nodding your head right now because I know that that's happening in your world too. And I wonder if you can sort of bring us up to uh, up to date on on where legal marketing is now because so many of those things that I've just described are at the core of the type of work that you do to help support um, law firms and attorneys in getting seen and then getting the prospective client to you know take an action and maybe reach out to them or uh, what whatever else happens so can you kind of walk us through some of that yeah well I'll say that uh Law firms, I guess, in really the last 10 years have made a shift from in the global legal perspective. Um, so those big global firms have really made a shift towards being more strategic. But I will say the people who actually led the charge on the digital front and on the marketing front were those personal injury lawyers because they were marketing in a different way. They were marketing directly to consumers, more that B2C type marketing that um, that many of those B2B type firms hadn't yet experienced or hadn't yet kind of dipped their toes into. And those personal injury lawyers, those B2C type firms, like an immigration firm that's marketing directly to a consumer or a family law firm, marketing directly to a consumer, they are they were marketing and leading the charge and saying, hey, we need to be doing this to develop business for ourselves. We need to be doing this. And um, they really paved the way. They were the ones that were pushing for SEO um, within their firms to write thought leadership pieces that got you know traffic to their website. They were the ones that were measuring first the data points. And then it eventually trickled up into the big firm kind of mentality. They started to hire digital strategists. They started to hire um, people who had the capabilities to better inform the data. And now where we're sitting is post-COVID, everyone's gotten on the bus. <laughs> everyone's realized that the bus is leaving and you can't really afford to ignore um, digital marketing. You can't really afford uh, afford to ignore marketing in general. And there are a few firms out there that'll still say, I'm going to ride or die on my yellow page ads or on my, <laughs> my ad in the, um, you know, in the, I don't know, newspaper, yeah. but generally you're seeing more and more realize that the internet isn't going anywhere and that I should be, have a presence here. I should develop relationships here and I should be building a personal brand here um, and thinking about the brand my firm has and what message resonates with my audience. All right. Let, let's talk about the, um, the personal brand thing, because 
um, I, I know you're doing that for your own business and you've had to probably go through a process of, of figuring out, Hey, what do I do? What is, what, what do I want people to see and think of me about? This is not necessarily a comfort zone for a professional services person, like an attorney, unless, unless they're, you know, a trial attorney and like to get up and, and, you know, um, perform, a lot of the attorneys I know, you know, estate planning attorneys, they're probably not too keen on, you know, putting themselves out there. But it was like the one very specific thing that you honed in on in terms of the thing that they need to do. So I wonder if you can help unpack the the importance of this and then maybe um, assuage somebody's fears about like what it really means to do it. Yeah, well, just as we've seen in the tech industry and in some of these SaaS companies, um, there really needs to be a face to the firm, a person who really is the connection point between clients, prospects, leads, um, just your audience in general. And we're seeing that more and more partners, especially in the larger global firms, are starting to realize that they have the opportunity to craft their own message, where in the past they would have had to pay a really expensive PR agency or a really expensive consultant to come in and help them create that message and push it out to the right networks and publications that would be important to their clients. And now post pandemic, we're seeing that LinkedIn has that opportunity for many, many of those lawyers, they can invest in their own personal brands, yep. they can invest the time and energy and writing great content and sharing great stories and sharing client successes if they're allowed to, and create that brand themselves. Um, and it's something they can take with them from firm to firm, because quite honestly, most lawyers now, there used to be a lot of loyalty within the firms in terms of partners sticking within a firm for a really long time. And that has really changed with the competitiveness of the market and the war on talent that happened in the pandemic. And so now we're seeing lawyers realize I should be building this personal brand because I can take it with me from firm to firm. If I'm unhappy with my firm, I can leave and go somewhere else as long as I have this personal brand that I've built that continues to generate business and revenue for me. I don't have to rely on the firm's resources to do that for myself. Now, this this <laughs> I, I I'm really curious now. Um, the work that you do, mm -hmm. do you get hired by individual attorneys who work within firms rather than the firms themselves? Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. If you uh, are a managing partner in a firm, don't listen to that little last clip that Jessica just shared because your attorneys are all staying in-house. They're never going. They're never leaving anywhere, right? Well, there's some advantage for the firm too to build and teach lawyers to use social media, LinkedIn, all of it strategically because it, it grows the entire um, profile of the entire firm and it allows them to showcase their talent in a unique way. Um, and that in and of itself is reason enough for you to spend the money to have someone like me come in and have a workshop because just that one workshop could pay well in dividends if just a few of your partners, you know, sees that opportunity to learn and build their personal brands and generate business yeah. for themselves. And it makes so. sense. It's it's not dissimilar to what I think I would counsel somebody in, I don't know, the the real estate space, for example, where the relationship between the, you know, the agents and the the umbrella organization that's um that they're working under is not dissimilar to a a firm. And so there's also probably helps build the relationship between those two parties, right? The the organization, the firm, and and the attorneys who are working there because they're getting added value and support when they're getting access to these types of training and resources. Correct. And they're able to um, teach others within the, you know, when one person learns it well and one person adopts the habits to build that network, they become kind of the poster child for the firm of what we want to aspire to be, what we expect from our partners and our associates in terms of business development, marketing, and thought leadership. Mm -hmm. And they get to be the example that the firm sets and says, this is our standard. And then on top of that, they usually get compensated the best because they're generating the most business. So it's kind of a win-win for firms to invest in that. So let's shift now to kind of the what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, because we, we've talked about personal brand and and some of the platforms you mentioned specifically LinkedIn a, a few mm -hmm. minutes ago. What does, uh, I don't want to use the word funnel, but what does sort of the architecture or the framework of uh, legal marketing look like? We 
are we talking funnels <laughs> to our clients? Because I think it's important to conceptualize what it is we're trying to build. And so when we actually sit down with a lawyer, we talk to them, not just about what they want to be known for, but also about what kind of content, what kind of information is going to resonate. And is it going to be the fact that you've won a super lawyers award 500 times? Probably not versus something that's going to be a value that's going to be relevant, that's going to be timely, and that's going to resonate in that moment with the client's immediate need, desires, or questions they might have. Mm -hmm. So generally when we sit down with a lawyer to talk to them about their their individual personal brand, we're really walking them through understanding their story, understanding why they became a lawyer, and then talking to them about how we can position their story in a way that's attractive to their prospects and clients. Uh, because at the end of the day, humans hire humans, right? And we want to make sure that our lawyers are showcasing not only their expertise, but also who they are as people. Because uh, there are a lot of lawyers out there. And one of the fastest differentiators or best differentiators out there is actually just incorporating a bit about yourself into the content you're creating and into the profiles you're building um, because it does differentiate you at the end of the day. So what might that look like? I mean, they're, they're not exposing their entire personal, you know, self. They're not, you know, showing um, videos of their family at the beach or that kind of thing. What, what do you mean when you say, you know, sharing some part of themselves? Why did you go to law school? That's my number one question I ask lawyers, because you find you can uncover a lot just from that question alone. Yeah. Uh, you can ask them what was the, the biggest highlight of their entire legal career? Uh, what really shaped you as a lawyer? Who are your mentors? Who led you? Those types of questions that draw out these stories allow us then to craft kind of that message and help them weave that into the content they're creating. So it's not just a, Hey, I wrote this, you know, article on blah, blah, blah. No one cares about, right. It's starting with a story that leads into why this article is worth reading. Right. Mm -hmm. So early in my career, I was mentored by uh, a lawyer who then taught me these three things. And I, I wrote this article in encapsulating that in the legal issues you need to be aware of <laughs> and and think that all lawyers should take that same approach or think that all general counsels should take that same approach when thinking about the law. So it's kind of weaving in content like that, stories into the content you're creating that help make a point to the people who are reading your post content or reading your profile, why they should keep reading. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in many professions, I would see content like what you're describing followed by or, you know, ending with some form of a call to action. If this mm -hmm. resonated with you, here's the next step you should take. And I'm curious, is that a thing that can and ought to be done in the legal world? It depends on what the call to action is. <laughs> so um, many of our call to actions with lawyers is just building connections, um, building relationships, um, inviting people to a deeper conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, you know, here's my email if you have questions. Or um, we even recommend that lawyers spend a lot of time in the comments of other people's posts, less about sharing what they're creating and more about just commenting on other people's posts and providing their perspective or asking a question or you know, encapsulating the entire post in a takeaway and then saying how you're going to implement that takeaway. Things like that, just spending that time in the comments of other people's posts is a way for lawyers to generate visibility for themselves, generate opportunities for themselves, grow their, their connections, and ultimately get what they want in the end, which is potential prospects who are interested in what they're sharing and what they have to say, having them on their list, their short list of people to call if they have a question on that issue. I, I guess it also likely depends on the area of law that somebody's practicing in, because sometimes there is an incident that sparks the need for the services of an attorney. And oftentimes it's not right. So oftentimes it's that, you know, they, they are there um, when somebody decides that they finally are ready to move forward. And so th that's going to probably impact the the way that they're instructing somebody to reach out to them or around what purpose? I'll tell you the bulk of clients, um, the bulk of our clients, their clients 
aren't always in the need for services in that moment. They're mm -hmm. more taking the time to just educate and let them know they offer these services. And if, and when you're in need of them, you know, reach out to us, connect with us, talk yep. to us. Um, there are instances though, where there's shifts in the law or changes in the law where a call to action that's so bold as contact us now is necessary. Right now though, most of the lawyers that I work with, they're waiting for the right time and place for their prospects and leads to potentially be in that moment of need. And so they need to create visibility and awareness just that they exist. They need to stay top of mind because at the end of the day, nobody can hire you if they don't know you exist. So yeah. that's what we tell our lawyers. You need to spend the time just building your brand, reminding people what you do and addressing some of those issues that come up and knowing that your all your connections aren't in that moment going to be ready to hire. So uh, again, I'm going to contrast this to other areas of professional services because mm -hmm. I know them well and I'm and I just honestly curious about how this can or um how you think it should be done in the legal world. One of the um big concerns around lots of social platforms and other public platforms is you as a business don't own them, right? You don't mm -hmm. own that space. And so uh, we often will counsel um, businesses to pull people off of there and communicate one-on-one -on -one directly through an email list or some other form. Is that something that uh, works, doesn't work in the, in the legal world? And how, you know, what kinds of communications make sense? It depends what it is. <laughs> So um, we find that building those connections and those relationships can be really powerful on LinkedIn, but sometimes there needs to be a white paper or um, a webinar or something that prompts people to get more information. And that is where something like that can, can definitely lead to building your email list and definitely can be a place where you can then tag them as being interested in whatever topic, right? And segmenting them into the appropriate list. But Generally, we find that most people start the conversation on LinkedIn, will send an actual message, or will go to the, the actual attorney's profile on their webpage, do the due diligence check to confirm that this attorney who's creating the LinkedIn content and creating their profile is actually legit and working for the firm they claim to work for, <laughs> and then reach out via email. Okay. So um, there's definitely an opportunity to do that. And we do um, build funnels. We do recommend having some sort of lead magnet or opt-in that's going to entice people to get on your email list. But um, we generally find that just creating that content, putting it out there in the world is enough. Now you don't own the platforms that you're on. So you make a very good point on the importance of collecting that information timely and putting them into your CRM or your Rolodex or whatever system you're using to keep track of your contacts um, and finding some way to get them um, to download a white paper or attend a webinar. But I'll be honest, legal webinars tend to be a very nuanced, dry, <laughs> I love lawyers, but man, it is a very specific topic for a very specific type of person who's in need for that thing at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so you just need to be aware that when you're creating a legal webinar, <laughs> that it's something that will address an issue that's large enough to make sense for you to spend the time to create a webinar mm -hmm. or to spend the time to make that white paper. Um, for example, when COVID happened, there were a lot of lawyers putting out content on remote workforces and things. That was a timely event that made sense to produce that level of content. There are other things that I don't think necessarily always rise to that level of need for a, a full in opt in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think as I'm thinking about it, you know, there's we have all this technology that's capable of supporting communications in ways that we didn't in the past. And if you think about um, you know, the the typical funnel where you're capturing somebody's contact information and then you're continuing to follow up with them, oftentimes through automation, right? You have that system working for you behind the scenes and you don't have to be um, actively participating in it. But what I'm hearing from you is that that not, is not necessarily the way that attorneys will nurture a relationship. And I'm And I'm curious, you know, is that just not a workable scenario in most of the legal world or is there opportunity that, that uh, they could leverage if they wanted to? 
So in the B2C world, that automation is very prevalent and working and sophisticated. In the B2B world, it's much more high touch, much more personalized. And um, generally when I work with partners, they want to have a much more personalized approach in their outreach. They want to make sure that if it's a high caliber client who downloaded that white paper, that they're not getting an automated email. They want it to feel like the attorney took the time to write that personalized message to the person and address that specific issue. Um, And I think that's just because they are a very white glove industry. And the idea is that it is very customized and personalized attention. For many attorneys, they're hesitant to use automation in that way because so much of their brand is built around this idea that we are going to really be attentive to client service and really be attentive to your needs. And I think that they, for that reason, will be, will want to be much more high touch than the typical kind of marketing strategy that might have marketing automation built in. Yeah. I I take for granted that um, when I say automation, I know that I mean both front facing and back end, meaning reminding the attorney, hey, you haven't reached out to prospect, you know, X, Y, Z, you should. And then continuing to badger the attorney until they say, okay, I did it. And then they move on because they make sure that they've gone through the process. So I I totally agree with you that, you know, there there has to be a more personalized approach in certain types of relationships makes makes total sense. Um, Mm -hmm. So I should say automation supported uh, communications perhaps. Well, yeah. And there's, you know, in many of these firms, there's business development managers and business development specialists who are there to do that kind of shoulder tapping and say, Hey, we saw that this person downloaded this white paper. And that's a really important VP at that big, large company that you're trying to get work from. We should make sure that we send them something, whether it be a brochure or an email or an invitation to lunch, right? Like let's, let's try to create a more intentional outreach than, um, than we typically would do. So thinking about kind of the, the structure of all this, how this all, you know, maps out, um, I, I imagine this is, you know, you you have a perspective on sort of what the broad plan for marketing in in the uh, legal world might look like. If a firm or an attorney is sort of starting to think through this process and and they want to understand what are all of the components of this, as I'm putting a plan together to position myself to communicate, et cetera. What kind of, you know, what what kind of consideration should they have? Um, Message, um, channels. Um, We actually have a whole uh, marketing plan we have available for download that will link, um, I believe, in the show notes. That'll kind of create the first kind of one pager marketing plan. Um, But really, it's, it's about thinking about who your audience is, what your message is, and what channels you need to have that message on. And then from there, it's really thinking about what message resonates the most with your clients. And that's where the power of social media can be uh, amazing (laughs) as a tool, because you can test a lot of messaging relatively quickly um, with a tool like social media and decide, did this resonate or not before I spend all the time and energy to write that client alert, right? Or spend all the time and energy to put that webinar together. Let's see what's really resonating and what's prompting action. Um, so that's where I always recommend to start, start with a marketing plan, take the time to fill out our worksheet that we have, um, and really think about where you should be showing up and what your message should be and, um, making sure that it's tailored to your audience and it's timely and relevant to them in that moment. So in a moment, we'll actually share a link where people can, can grab that marketing plan template. But, but before I I do, you mentioned something about testing, right? This is a very important uh, phase of marketing is to actually put stuff out there and see how people react. And I want to link this to a a topic that I saw you covered in a video recently uh, on the topic of artificial intelligence as it, mm-hmm. as it pertains to marketing in the, in the legal world. And we don't want to talk about the sort of all of the legal implications and the ethical implications and the, you know, putting, putting, um, uh, firm or client to confidential details. What, what I want to talk about very specifically is idea generation, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say test a bunch of things, well, that requires that you have to kind of figure out what are all the things, what are the wide range of things that people want to test? I wonder if you can speak for a moment about like 
how to be able to leverage this kind of technology to come up with those ideas and test as many things as quickly as possible. Yeah. So we love AI for this purpose. Um, so I always tell my clients, start with your consults, start with your discovery discussions. What questions are you getting asked there? And then throw those into something like a chat GPT, throw them, <laughs> write them in and ask chat GPT, what are some other questions around this? Or what are some other um, con um, ideas of that I should be considering. I actually like to use ChatGPT a lot to put in um, like my ideal client persona into ChatGPT. So, you know, uh, HR director at a global healthcare <laughs> company, mm -hmm. and they are going to have these types of pain points that are addressed uh, are coming up consistently. Let's say um, uh, turnover and employment discrimination type things come up across their desk every day. So. I put that into chat GPT and then I ask, what are the other pain points that I didn't think of? Or what are the other concerns or questions that might come up in this day to day for this HR professional? And you will end up getting so much back from chat GPT of ideas and things that maybe you just didn't think of in your initial round. It really speeds up the ideation process of thinking about the questions people have um, and the ways to approach content so that you can test that messaging out and see what really resonates. Um, so that's, that would be my suggestion. Take what you already have, throw it into ChatGPT and say, okay, pretend you're an HR manager at a global healthcare company and you have these issues and tell me what are some of your other concerns you might have, or what are some other issues that you might need addressed more immediately? Yeah, so. I, I, I love that. And, and it's incredibly useful. So th thanks for walking us through that. So I, I want to make sure that folks know a little bit about, um, what you do, who you serve. Mm -hmm. We kind of mentioned that a moment ago and then how they can uh, get access to the uh, the marketing plan template that, that you told us about as well. Yeah, so I'm Jessica Aries. I'm a lawyer turned digital marketer. Um, I help busy lawyers perfect their digital brands online. We work with law firms, lawyers, and legal consultants, basically anyone in the legal industry. And we're really looking to help people create visibility for themselves and build personal brands that are really compelling and attract the right clients and audience um, so that people spend their time doing the marketing that makes the most impact. Um, our marketing plan that we have available for our, on our website is actually at the URL link.byaries.com slash more perfect marketing. And that link will actually lead you to the marketing plan template, which you can download and access and start working through building your own marketing plan. And if you come across a question or you feel a little over your head, please reach out or connect with me on LinkedIn. It's a great place just to chat and start a conversation. Um, if you aren't on LinkedIn, now's the time. Get on. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. Well, that that's an episode for another day. Um, uh, LinkedIn presence for attorneys. And that's a great reason to have you back. Jessica, thank you so very much for joining me. This has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, indeed. Folks, this has been More Perfect Marketing. If you know a legal professional who might benefit from listening to this conversation, please share it with them. Until next time, my name is David Bear. We'll see you back here soon. Bye-bye.